to 913. Now, a couple other things that happened with this new rule is that every three years, this salary level, that $913 a week or $47,476, is going to go up every three years. And that's part of this new rule. We have an idea. They've given us some level of guidance of what those increases are going to look like. But right now, we don't know exactly what they are because they're not hard and fast. We just need every three years. This is something we're going to need to deal with. What this new rule does is it strengthens overtime for salary workers that are already entitled to overtime. So you get more overtime protection for people who really should be getting overtime. And it's going to give clarification for workers' employers. Now you've got this increased salary level. You've got your duties test, which has not changed. but if you've got someone who's been classified as salaried exempt because they were over $455 but less than $913 a week, you're going to have some decisions to make. And we're going to help walk you through those today. So as I mentioned, no changes on the duties test. And, and that's kind of a separate event itself in terms of evaluating duties for various positions. So, uh, that's, a, that's a separate education session. But this particular rule is going to become effective December 1st. Good news for you. You're on this webinar today. You've got lots of time to plan, decide your strategy, so that you'll be able to implement with plenty of time. The other part of the new rule that's changed is the highly compensated employee classification. It's now gone up from $100 some odd thousand dollars to $134,000 four bucks a year. So we're going to cover a little bit more about that later on in the webinar. So just in case you were sleeping under a rock somewhere for the last six months and you're saying, what in the world just took place? I can't believe I missed this. What happened? Give me some history on this. OK, let me back up and I'm going to tell you exactly what has taken place to get to this new rule process. Back in January of 2014, in President Obama's State of the Union address, he talked a lot about dealing with stagnant wages. And uh, the truth be known, uh, really, we believe that he wanted to increase the minimum wage. But given the state of the Congress and the President, it was just not going to happen. The overall wage increase for minimum wage was just not going to happen because of the political climate. So since that was not a possibility, in March, he sends a memorandum to Secretary Perez, Secretary of Labor Perez, requesting to revise the overtime regulations. Again, trying to get a better understanding, help with wage increases, uh, help with managing workforce and working, working time. So he actually sent this memo to uh, Secretary of Labor Perez to revise these overtime regulations due to the need to address the stagnant wage situation. Then back in the summer of 2014, uh, there were some listening sessions where Secretary Perez actually met with businesses and organizations, um, some members of the Society of Human Resource Management, unions, you name it, met with a lot of people to get their feedback about the current process for determining whether a position is exempt, non-exempt, what were the problems associated with the current wage structure and, and salary requirements. And then uh, what happened was from then, there was a rule that was made in July. We actually saw that happen in 2015. Uh, where wage and hour uh, administrator while issued those changes as part of the regulation. So the comment period was going to be closing as of September 4th, 2015. Then all of a sudden in March of this year, this final rule was sent to the Office of Management and Budget. And here we are just last month in May, 
the Department of Labor announced the new salary threshold for certain employees that qualify as exempt from the minimum wage and overtime rules, okay? So, a lot of history that went on here. I know we had some of our staff actually go to Washington to make comments about these regulations, and we were pretty concerned. We thought it was going to be something similar to the Affordable Care Act, and, you know, we might actually have some similarities in terms of changes. As, so, as those of you who know who have had to deal with the Affordable Care Act, those rules came out. There have been several modifications to them. We also think maybe there could be some potential modifications to this, but at this point in time, it's still pretty fresh. We're only a little bit more than a month into it right now, so this is kind of what we have to deal with. So, how did this get put into place? Well, I actually mentioned this a minute ago. We had over 300,000 comments that were given to the Department of Labor last year in response to these proposed changes. So actually that came from businesses, came from individuals, all those people that we talked about who the Secretary of Labor brought in to be able to talk about what changes needed to take place. So lots and lots of people weighed in on it and probably had a positive impact on why we only saw a change in the salaries test and not the duties test. So let me talk you through what the old overtime rules were. So for any of you who might need a quick refresher on where we were versus where we're going, let me just kind of go back in time here and address what the Fair Labor Standards Act, that's the FLSA, Fair Labor Standards Act. They require that covered employers pay minimum wage, and from a federal level, that's $7.25 per hour. And of course, if you know, depending on what state or municipality area you might be located, whether it's in Kentucky, Indiana, or someplace else across the United States, be aware that your state may have very specific, or municipality may have specific increases to this. But at the federal level, the minimum is $7.25 per hour. And then overtime is to be paid at time and a half on time that's worked in excess of 40 hours per work week. So unless someone, an employee, is exempt from those requirements, you got to pay the overtime if they don't meet that exemption test. Now, the exemptions are few, and the, the descriptions are pretty vague. And keep in mind, if you've got some kind of an audit that comes up, and the Department of Labor or one of the state affiliations comes to your organization to conduct an audit, you're probably going to have an auditor or investigator from the Department of Labor and they will have their own specific requirements. I have met several investigators, and some see things very differently from their counterparts. And that is you know, kind of what happens when you've got a human element involved with an investigation. So one of the things that you need to understand about that duties test is they, there are very few exemptions, and uh, a lot of them rely on judgment and independent decision making, and that can vary from person to person in how you interpret a specific position description. So realize that you've got the salary test and the duties test, and the employees must be paid a certain amount in salary, which is, was before, same kind of deal. Now the salary level has just increased substantially. So what was the salary level for the overtime exemption? Okay, so again, what it was was for executive, administrative, and professional workers to be exempt from overtime eligibility, they needed to be paid a salary of $23,660 a year or $455 a week. So that was the old rule. Now, how much has that changed? Well, here's the deal, folks. It's now going to be $913 per week effective December 1st, or $47,476 per year for your full-time worker uh, effective December 1st. 
Now, we've got uh, the application of this for, as I mentioned, executive, administrative, and professional positions. But keep in mind that outside sales professionals, that exemption is not tied to the salary and was not impacted by this change. So a couple of times I've talked with people and they say, well, I've got outside sales people and they meet the outside sales exemption requirement. Do they have to get a salary increase? No, the answer is no. As long as they meet the duties test outlined by the Department of Labor, then no, there's no change to them. Also, keep in mind doctors, lawyers, bona fide teachers, they're not subject to this either. And computer professionals, they already have their own pay requirements and they have their own duties test. So take a look at the duties test associated with your computer people, but they're already in excess of this number. So they are really not impacted by this particular change. So Moving along here on the salary level, how did the Department of Labor get to this new salary requirement? Well, what they did was they took a look at where were the lowest earning workers across the country. And so they took this number, the 40th percentile of those earnings of full-time salaried workers in that lowest wage census region, and that is currently the South. So that was how they decided what the newest level of salary was going to be, and that was the 40th percentile of earnings of, of full-time salaried workers. Okay, so could have been something else, could have been worse, I guess, but at this point in time, that was the basis for how they made their decision. Now, another good question that came up is, can we include bonuses toward calculating the $913 a week salary level? Well, the answer is yes, but you've got to make sure they meet the specific criteria. You can only allow for up to 10% of that $913 a week salary level to come in the form of non-discretionary bonuses or incentive pay or commissions as long as that portion is paid at least quarterly. So, so let me just give you a couple examples here. Let's say that you're operating a manufacturing firm and you have an incentive plan that gets paid maybe quarterly, given this, this scenario, uh, and that bonus or incentive is based upon number of units manufactured as well as percentage of quality and safety. So those things, you have three components that you would pay out to your employees based upon achievement of a certain level, and it would be a guaranteed incentive. That would potentially qualify because it does not include any discretionary component. So I mentioned this discretionary component. If you've got bonuses where it's subject to management's discretion or someone could say, ah, it's not guaranteed, then those are not going to qualify. So take a look at your bonus programs, your incentive programs, and remember only 10% of what those, 10% uh, of that total can be part of that incentive. So if they have a non-discretionary component, they will not be able to be considered part of this plan. Okay, so will this new salary level change again? Yep, as I mentioned earlier, it's going to change and increase every three years. And it's going to also be set at that 40th percentile of weekly earnings among full-time salaried, not necessarily exempt salaried, but full-time employees in the country's lowest income region. Right now, that's currently the South. It could change someplace else, but right now it is the South. And we do expect that the change is going to be effective January 1st, 2020. And then you're going to see it go from the 47, 476 to approximately $51,168. So we're going to see another change here in three years. Okay, well there's been some scuttlebutt about this duties test. Remember I told you there's two parts to determining whether a position is exempt from overtime or not. 
the salary test. That's what we're talking about. That's what this webinar is because that's what's changed. And then the second part, which is the duties test, and that's what we're going to talk about right now. So when you take a look at this duties test, you know, there was some discussion as part of changes that how we decided whether a position was exempt from overtime or not would change. Did that happen? And the answer is no, it did not. The Department of Labor has been very specific at saying that there's no changes right now with the duties test. They have expressed concerns with them, so we're expecting at some point in time those duties tests will change for executives, administrative, professional positions, maybe some others. Right now, they have not. So we think that answer is be prepared, folks. You could see more change coming down the path fairly soon. But no more news at this point. So right now, the current definition of primary duty is still the principal, main, major, the most important duty that the employee performs on their job. So when we're looking at determining the duties, that primary duty is still something that has stayed very constant. So are there any other significant changes that we should be thinking about as part of this new rule? Well, it increases the minimum salary threshold for the highly compensated employee. And highly compensated employee exemption went from $100,000 a year to $134,004 a year. So this has also a streamlined duties test. So if you haven't taken a look at your highly compensated employees duties test, it's pretty streamlined. But that salary level, that's a pretty daggone big jump from hundred grand to $134,000. So that's something if you've got people in that particular classification, you're going to need to take a look at their salaries. Next, how does the final rule compare to what was actually proposed? Well, this is interesting because it was lowered. When we started taking a look at the comments and what was initially proposed, uh, the number was 50,440. And that number kind of weaseled its way around all over the board, you know, in February, early March, started seeing some changes. And of course, HR professionals, we all started raising our eyebrows thinking, holy smokes, this is going from you know, something very minimal, $455 a week to, holy wow, over 50 grand. So it could have been worse, right? Now it's 47,476. We also expected that the compliance deadline was going to be a quick turnaround. Uh, the Department of Labor kept saying it was going to be a 60-day turnaround. Fortunately for employers, we've got some time. We've got time that uh, we have now until December 1st to get this done. And really, by not having any changes to that duties test or the definition of what a primary duty is, that gives us a little bit of relief, too. If there have been additional changes in those duties, then it would be an even more increased complex decision that we would have to make as an employer on what we're going to do with employees who are exempt and under the new salary threshold. And then, of course, we heard that uh, there was going to be an annual increase in this salary level, and now that is going to be an every three-year kind of change. So I guess the good news, as I said earlier, is it could have been a lot worse for us. So again, December 1st is our deadline, so what I'm encouraging our clients and friends to do is to carefully think out what you want to do and carefully think about some of the challenges that your organization faces. There's also some very specific rules and requirements for government and not-for-profits. And what I'm encouraging our not-for-profit clients to do and friends, actually we're helping them working with our clients on this, but for those of you that we may not be working with right now, 
is there are some fact sheets associated with the changes and how not-for-profits can calculate. They have a minimum threshold for whether they are, are, are part of this or not. And those fact sheets can be found at the Department of Labor's website at www.dol.gov. So if your business falls in those areas, I would encourage you to take a look at those fact sheets since we're not going to be taking a deep dive into those areas today. But the good news, again, as I'm saying, you've got till December 1st of this year in which to get your plan. So we're going to give you a roadmap here in just a second on what to do. So, okay, if you're like a lot of employers, you're saying, holy smokes, I really don't want to deal with this. It sounds like a hassle. I've got a number of employees that I've been paying a salary to who I believe are exempt from the overtime requirement but they aren't being paid $47,476. Is there anything that can be done to stop or slow this thing down? Well, as you can imagine, there are some measures right now in the House and the Senate to delay this. No different than ACA, Affordable Care Act. We do expect some potential slowdown, some delays, maybe some changes. But right now, we know those measures are pending. You know, Congress may attempt to delay the rule, and then, you know, the business community is very concerned about this because, you know, you're taking a salary level of $455 and, in essence, doubling it plus. So that is a huge financial burden, and particularly on the non-for-profit and higher education community. So, again, very few organizations are exempt from these rules, and uh, the not-for-profits have, a, have a, a, a threshold level and a two-step process, but very, very few organizations will be exempt from this situation. So this is kind of wait and see, folks. Right now, it is what it is. I'm encouraging you to go forward with some preparations. It is a big election year. Things could change after an election, but right now, we're dealing with what we're dealing with. So we've got to kind of continue forward. All right, so now let's get to where the rubber really meets the road on what can we do to figure out how to deal with this new ruling. Okay, and we've got a couple of options here for you. The first option, and it's just one option, right? It may or may not be the best option for you, but the first option would be to raise the salary of all the employees paid under the new level, paying less than the new level, to the minimum. And again, this would be for your exempt employees, those who meet the duties test, those who have met the previous salary test, you have defined that their position is not eligible for overtime based upon the D Department of Labor's duties test and the salaries test. And now you're going to just make the decision. They've already met those requirements. We're going to just raise them up to the new minimum. So here's the example about George. He's our facilities manager. He is currently classified as an exempt employee and he's paid an annual salary of $45,000. So what you could do is you could just take him from $45,000, say, hey, George, guess what? This new law came into effect. We're going to raise your pay. You're going you're to essentially get a $2,500 pay increase. Congratulations. This is taking place December 1st. That's one option, right? <laughs> may or may not be the best option. But uh, George would certainly be happy with just a uh, discretionary pay increase like that all of a sudden, right? Just boom, 2500 bucks. So what's the downfall of doing something like that? Well, first of all, if you just have one employee, it might not be too bad of an option. But a lot of people out there might have 10, 20, 40, or more, hundreds of people that could potentially be falling into this category. And so the first thing is, holy smokes, uh, this is totally going to blow our budget. And, you know, we really can't afford to do this, okay? The next concern is that every three years, the salary level is going to go up. So when you think about this, gee, what does this do to your merit increase process or how you're paying for performance with your employees? 
you know, it kind of makes it a federally mandated change in pay. So making automatic increases, uh, you know, again, this may not be feasible, and then it completely changes the dynamic with respect to how your employees view their pay. It's automatic. Maybe it's uh, completely not discretionary. It's not performance-based. This is dictated by the government. Which kind of leads into the third point about morale. Well, you know, you've got potential morale issues with managers. You know, they may be making above that threshold. Maybe they're making $48,000, $49,000, maybe $50,000. And, uh, you know, those people are saying, holy smokes, my friend over here was making a little less. They got a $2,500 increase. I'm not getting any increase. What's with that? And I'm a higher performer and I've been here longer. Oh my gosh, that's not fair. So you're, as an employer, you're going to have those kinds of issues to deal with. Again, the more employees you have to evaluate because they are below the new salary threshold, the more challenging I think this is going to be from a morale standpoint. Because you've got managers who might make slightly above, maybe they make well more than that, but you might have lower level or more entry level exempt people that, you know, giving them an automatic raise just doesn't make sense. It causes more pain with the rest of your workforce than does good. So you need to understand and evaluate carefully the dynamic of making these changes. How many people is it going to impact? The morale of making a change like this option one and what that's going to do to your budget as well as evaluating pay across the board with other people. So, you know, you might have these managers who think that being exempt is a perk too, right? So when you take a look at uh, perks and incentives for being exempt, we're going to get to this in a minute, but, you know, that can also uh, have, have a negative impact, and let me explain that in just a minute. But, um, you know, compensation compression issues is also going to be kind of a problem. You know, we have this age-old issue we talk about with people when you're recruiting new talent, and maybe you've got some employees who've been with your organization a long time, and maybe they, you know, they fall below this number. Maybe they fall below the 45, uh, 47,476 number. And you've got people that you're hiring, and you're hiring them well above this number. And, you know, you've got people who you're bringing in. The new people might be earning more. You've got other people who fall under that amount. Maybe you're going to raise those people up. Maybe you're going to move those people back to hourly. Again, this can cause a lot of pay compression issues that we don't even can anticipate at this point. So. What you're going to need to do is really understand what your workforce is looking like from a demographic standpoint and think about the cons associated with that. All right, here's another option. So let's just say that uh, raising everybody's salary that's below the 47476 just isn't feasible. What are we going to do to combat that? Well, the second option we have here is to change the employee status to a non-exempt and convert them from a salary paid position to hourly. So let's go back to this example of George. And he's the facilities manager, right? Um, what about if we take George, we, we take a look at his salary, and we divide it by the number of hours worked in the year to determine the hourly rate. You can see that right here. Um, and if you do the math, we use 2,080 hours per year, and that really comes up to 40 hours a week times 52 weeks, okay? So if you do the math on this, you run into an hourly rate of $21.63. So we take George, who's our facilities manager, and he essentially goes from $45,000 a year to $21.63. So, What's wrong with that? Well, you know, if you've got somebody 
who is working a whole lot of overtime and you're getting a lot of bang for the buck out of this, we are going to really see um, a big shift in our budgetary requirements, right? That people are going to be, you're going to be paying a whole lot more overtime. And that could be a potential problem. So we want to really monitor and understand whether someone is working a lot of overtime. If they're not working a lot of overtime, our next slide is going to address the issue of the person who is not or who is working a tremendous amount of overtime. The second con is that employees can no longer take a few hours off and be paid unless they have paid leave options. So if, when you convert someone from a salary to an hourly position, you know, they lose some flexibility, right? That's one of the benefits of having employees classified as salaried is, you know, maybe somebody can work a little over here, work a little less, work a little more on the weekend. Well, now if you've got someone and you're paying them hourly, you got to make sure that you're tracking their time, you're tracking their time off, they're requesting their time off, and they're actually, you know, working through that. So. You want to have, you're going to have to change some policies and procedures as well. So keep in mind that tracking of this time now is absolutely essential. It always has been, but if you're moving people from a salary to an hourly position, you're going to need to explain to them why. Explain to them the tracking methodology. Make sure you've got tools and procedures and you know, maybe you need a timekeeping system to help you with that. So again, you can't just let people behave as if they were salaried if you move them to hourly. It opens you up to a tremendous amount of liability. This third point is what I alluded to earlier is that you can have morale issues from employees who see being exempt as a perk, right? So being exempt is like a higher classification within an organization. I know that used to be the case uh, uh, many years ago, depending on how employee classifications were communicated into an organization. Uh, you'd have your hourly workers, you'd have your non-exempt, and then you'd have your salary people. Woo! It was like a big perk or like you got promoted <laughs> when in all reality someone who's working a lot of overtime would be making a lot more money if they were paid hourly in many cases. So again, that's a big con with moving someone from a salary to an hourly position. And then thinking about uh, this whole time clock mentality. You know, if we look at George, he's a manager and gosh, you know, we really need him to you know, carry the torch for the organization, really keep us moving forward, do whatever it takes to serve the customer. Well, what does that do to that mentality of just doing what it takes? It is tough, tough, tough. So could, could cause that, hey, I'm punching the clock. When I'm done, I'm done. Forget it. Well, that could have a huge impact on our business. So Keep in mind that uh, these are some specific cons. Let me go ahead and get here to another option that we have. This is kind of our option 2A, and this is what we call the cost neutral solution. Okay, now what this takes into account is that George is working an average of 10 hours overtime each week. So, this kind of gives us an opportunity to take into account the amount of overtime that he's working. And if you'll see on the math here, we're, we're going to use this, uh, and, I'm, and I'm sorry if I'm getting too dogmatic for those of you who are math geniuses out there, but you take the salary and then you're going to consider that they're working 40 hours a week and then you're going to get their overtime rate in here, right? So in George's example, he's working 10 hours of overtime each week. So if we take his salary, his weekly salary, and we run the math, we can get his hourly rate to $15.73. Now, this is a legitimate way to calculate George's hourly rate. And the reason that it is legitimate is that this formula was actually given to us by the Department of Labor in uh, their proposed rulemaking back in 2003. So, what I would caution you on is you can only 
very carefully have an expectation of how many overtime hours a person is working. So you can't calculate this on a weekly basis. You're probably going to want to apply the formula on a much larger range of time. So if you know that, okay, we're going to set the person's pay rate based upon the last six months, that's probably pretty reasonable. But you don't want to change their rate of pay every week based upon their expected overtime. Now, with this hourly rate, yes, you do have to pay overtime on top of the $15.73, right? But if you take a look at the previous slide and you're just doing a straight calculation, your hourly rate is going to be a lot higher in this first option or the option two here on this particular slide as compared to option 2A, which it takes it down to $15.73. And again, the reason for this option is uh, you know, again, you're you're paying a lower rate in anticipation that George is going to be paid 10 hours of overtime every week anyway. Okay, so these are two options, right? Two options. One really is taking everybody from wherever they are salary wise and moving them up to $47,476. That's one option. The second option is taking them and making everybody hourly. Okay, now you've got a couple different ways to calculate what that hourly uh, rate is or what it potentially could be, but the key here is you really need to think carefully about moving people back to an hourly position and what that's going to do for your organization. All right, so where can I get more information about the rules? Well, of course, the Department of Labor has got all kinds of stuff out there. There's a lot of information to weed through. So I'd say sit back, get a cup of coffee, plan on, you know, you know how it is. You get on the Internet, you always spend way more time on things than you expect. So go through the details. You know, if you're a not-for-profit or a school system or a higher education entity, you may want to go in and look at your specific fact sheet. But keep in mind, um, there's some webinars out there. There's information um, that they're providing us as business leaders on what to do. And it's pretty much what we're giving you today in a nutshell. But for the most part, every organization really needs to uh, participate and comply with this. So uh, keep in mind, this is really what the rules are. OK. so. What else are there as far as legal complexities? No, by the way, quick question. People were asking if uh, the slides are going to be available. We're actually going to be recording this presentation, and you'll have access to it again. So that's uh, after we complete the presentation, we welcome you to review it again as often as you like. OK. So. A couple of other legal complexities that we're going to need to be thinking about now with these new changes, and that is email and internet access. I've been reading a lot and talking with people a lot about um, internet and what are we going to do, and are we going to shut off email for people? Well, you know, this is something that you really need to think about as far as getting your policies and procedures in place. If you've got a lot of people that this change is going to impact, and then you're going to really need to think about how you're treating your employees. Do you need to change policies, um, or do you need to change behaviors? You know, I was working with an organization the other day, and uh, the question came up, well, I've got some employees. They want to read emails at night so that they're prepared in the morning. How do you handle that? I said, well, why don't you just account for that time? You know, Everybody needs to track their time and track the time worked overtime. So right now, not based on a daily rate, it's based on your weekly rate, right? So let's not all freak out. Let's think about what can we do to compartmentalize this. I'm not sure that cutting everybody's email off is going to send a message uh, that's positive around how you want to handle your customers. But it's a very real issue that uh, the Department of Labor is saying, gee, if you know, hourly workers are checking their time, checking email, responding to email, that should be considered time worked. 
okay, that's fine. So just make sure that you've got some policies and practices in place to track that time and manage overtime accordingly. I know a lot of uh, clients that we've been working with, they're concerned that, oh wow, we, you know, maybe our employees are working a lot more than we realize. Well, you might need to do a little bit of an audit of how people are working. How much are your people working? Do you know? You might need to track that to find out before you make a decision on whether you're raising salaries or moving people back to an hourly paid position, okay? So you might really want to think about that. Same thing with travel, you know, how people travel, you know, there's rules around travel, you know, when you're driving, you know, and these are all, again, for non-exempt employees, people who are eligible for overtime. Your salary people, <laughs> guess what, you guys get to work all the time, right? No overtime, but um, for your hourly people, there's some rules around travel pay. So, you know, if you're moving people from salaried to an hourly position and they're traveling, you need to understand there are going to be rules around that. You may need to beef up your policies on that. You also um, are going to need to think about telecommuting. And um, sometimes you might have people who've been telecommuting and they've been salaried workers and now they're not going to meet the requirements. Well, how are you going to expect your telecommuters to keep track of time? Again, you need to look at a very good systematic, systematic approach to track that. And then you may have some claims. Maybe you've got people who are going to say, well, I've been retaliated against, you know, as a result of this. Uh, what are we going to do about that? Or, you know, you as an employer are treating me differently. Well, you know, we live in a very litigious society. And, uh, you know, right now it seems to me that uh, what we're hearing and what we're experiencing from the Department of Labor is that, you know, if there's complaints that are being made, those complaints are being investigated. So as an employer, following the law is what you need to do, right? And as an employer, you need to document it. So when you're moving through this, change, you want to make sure you're doing it accurately and documenting it. The Department of Labor does not mess around when they're giving fines. If they believe that an employer owes employee back pay, uh, they may go through and take a look at every employee in that classification and require back pay on every employee. They may feel that you've misclassified an employee, so be careful about that. Uh, and especially this last point is, you know, if they feel that you're just moving employees to independent contractors to get around this, boy, you're really in trouble. And, you know, if you read or you do a little bit of research around the Department of Labor and when they do an investigation for overtime violations, it's really expensive. Those fines can be $50,000, $100,000, I mean, small employers have had huge fines. And, you know, even some very, very large uh, big box stores that you all recognize the names of have had fines because employees have gone and complained and investigations have resulted in back pay, fines, and, and so forth when class, classifications have not been made properly. So what can you do to get ready for these changes? Well, let's go through these steps now. Keep your notes. Uh, this is what I think you really need to be looking at. Number one, start your preparation now and create a timeline for the decisions that you're going to need to make. Uh, you know, this isn't something we've got to go, oh, we have to make a decision right now. We've got till December to implement. But you may say to your employees or you may talk with your leadership and say, look, we need to make a decision by September 1st. We need to do some due diligence right now, such as, number one, we need to figure out how much overtime people are working. You know, I have I've talked with some, some uh, business owners, and they say, I don't think my people are working 40 hours a week. I'm not worried about it. If I switch them to salaried, I'm going to be in an advantage. Well, if you don't know, you need to find out. So do your due diligence. Find out, you know, how many employees are truly eligible to be in the salary classification because they meet the duties test and they meet the, and, and maybe they don't meet the salary test. Find out who's in that classification and do some due diligence around how much they're working at this point so that you can make a good decision about raising salaries or moving people to an hourly position. Take a look at the number of people that you're dealing with. It could be one or two. Maybe it's nobody. Or maybe you've got a big group and it's going to have a huge impact on your business. This is the time to do that due diligence now. Next is tell people what you're going to do. Now, 
One thing that I think is important is maybe you don't know what you're going to do right now. Well, just tell people, I'm not sure what we're going to do, but we're making our plans. We'll let you know October 1st, and we'll be notifying people in November. Whatever the case may be, whatever your timetable is, put something down, communicate that as a leadership team so that your employees know that something is being evaluated and a decision will be rendered. You may also need to, uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you have to decide who needs to be reclassified, but you may need to put in a new pay plan for these reclassified employees. You know, when you had people in a salaried scenario, now you've got people in an hourly compartment. Well, how you're paying them, how you're rewarding them, um, whether they're salaried or hourly, um, could vary greatly depending on the size of organization that you're with and the number of people and employees that are impacted by this. Probably the biggest thing that I think you're going to need to do as a key step here is to take a look at wage and hour policies and processes. All this after hours work, electronic device usage, you know, telecommuting, anybody who's working off the clock, travel, and even overtime policies, you need to know what the rules are. So many times I talk to employers and we talk about their salaried employees. Well, they just arbitrarily decide. I'm going to just pay that person a salary because I want to. Well, you can do whatever you want to, but it might not be without consequence, right? So if you're not sure what the duties test is at this point in time and you've got people classified as salary, you're going to need to understand that you've got to comply with this, and if you don't, you are at risk for a lot in, in not complying with the rules. The next part of this is you need to update your job descriptions and make sure that that classification is correct. As I mentioned, if you don't know, and I know there's a lot of people out there that don't, you need to figure out what it is that is going to be critical for your business. So you need to go, go to the Department of Labor's website, grab the duties test if you need some expert assistance, uh, reach out to uh, a professional um, like us or the legal team to help you with that. Then you need to communicate these changes and then probably one of the big things that people forget is, okay, now we need to train people. If we've moved them from one classification to another and we expect them to keep track of their time, well, we better show them what we expect them to do and how we expect them to do it so that um, they're doing it properly. So keep in mind now is a really important time to take a look at your compliance issues. Are you, do you have people classified properly? Are they really employees? Are they volunteers? Are they interns? You know, how do you have people classified? And then same thing, you know, who's exempt and who's not? And then what about your time clock and reporting practices? So, you know, there's a lot of things that you really should be taking a look at and changing your policies and procedures to reflect the changes that we're going to be implementing December 1st. So uh, what are some options for learning more? Well, if, hey, you're on this webinar, congratulations. But there's also some free Department of Labor run webinars, as I mentioned, on their website. And we've got a couple of things that we're going to make available to you, especially if you're a do-it-yourselfer. Uh, we've heard from a lot of people and they say, look, I just I don't have a lot of money to figure this out, but I need some checklists, tools, resources to help me get this done. Well, we actually have something called an HR Support Center where you can log into this system, you can get sample implementation guides, a decision-making guide, a fact sheet, a reclassification letter for people who need to be reclassified, some sample time tracking memos, you know, what you expect. There's a whole bunch of stuff inside this solution. It's an online solution. You get to log in with your own username and password, and you've got all these resources. And it's a yearly subscription. It's got all kinds of other wonderful resources, sample job descriptions, sample policies, uh, rules, laws by state. So it's got a whole bunch of information outside of what we're presenting today. But I've had a number of people say, gee, Amy, I want something to do myself. Where can I get it in an easy-to-find place where I've got step-by-step -step instructions? This is the place. And you're going to get an email following this webinar so that you'll have the opportunity to take advantage of that. 
The next option that we've got is, oh, I don't have time for this. I want somebody just to do it for me. So would you please help? <laughs> and of course, we'd be happy to do that for you. Our consulting team's been helping all of our clients. So if you're a client of ours on this call, we are in the process of working with you right now on how you're going to handle this. But if you're not, we'd like to help you get a practical approach. So you know, these violations of the Fair Labor Standards Act, as I mentioned earlier, can be very expensive. And, you know, you don't want to be unprepared. If you've got a big bank account here like Warren Buffett's, you might be in a different spot. But I can assure you that these things can be quite expensive. So those are some two offers to help you get through this quickly, succinctly, and professionally. And of course, we're here to help you. Feel free to give me a call if I can help. Now, I want to go ahead. We've got some time left here. I want to answer the questions that have come through the chat. So bear with me. Um, let's see. Uh, sample question. Uh, OK, I'm not sure here. Um, OK, so it looks like we've got a question about uh, the commission amount. It's a uh, it is 10% of the salary. The person's salary is what we're talking about in terms of the, com the what commissions can be. So if you take a look at our slide relative to what can be concluded, is 10% of the income may be in the form of non-discretionary bonuses. Okay, so again, just a clarification point on that. Um, and it does need to, you know, those incentives have to be paid out every quarter. Uh, so we have several designers who are salaried. They do a lot of work on site, away from the office, which is very hard to track. Um, does their position as interior designer mean they are still exempt from overtime? Well, again, I would encourage you to grab the duties test. I'm not sure what you're exactly, you know, your the type of business, but they may fall into the creative professional realm. And uh, I would encourage you to go out to the Department of Labor's website, grab that duties test, grab the job description, go through that process, make sure that they meet the requirement to be exempt from overtime, and then you're good to go. If they don't, then you'll be looking at an hourly position, but that's something certainly um, I, I do think you're going to want to take a look at the duties test in addition to uh, the salary. Okay, we didn't talk about salary non-exempt category changes. Well, no, we didn't talk about that because, um, wow, if you're non-exempt, you're still eligible for overtime, right? So uh, you're going to have people who you're paying a salary plus you're paying them overtime as well. So again, that one um, you're going to need to be thinking about, you know, paying someone a salary, paying them non-exempt. You know, I think you're going to see more people that's going to make the decision of either pay the salary if the, if the person meets the duties requirement to be exempt, or we're going to make we're going to make them an hourly but paid person. They get a specific amount of money every week and overtime on top of that. So you may need to take a look at how you're uh, defining that position. We don't have any specific. Um, recommendation on that at this point in time, but if they don't meet the salaries duties test, they're technically considered non-exempt, of course, and eligible for overtime. So if you have any other questions, feel free to put those into chat, but uh, I want to thank everybody for being here. I'm going to take a couple minutes here. If you have anything else that you're thinking about, I'll be happy to follow up with you on any of these questions that you've asked, and perhaps if I've not answer them fully, feel free to email me or give me a call. I'd be happy to talk with you about that following this webinar. So we'll take about 30 seconds. If anybody has any final questions, I'll let you type those in. All right. Well, I think that just about does it. Again, my name is Amy Lecky. It's been a pleasure to be with you today to talk about these new Fair Labor Standards Act changes. If we can be a resource to you or help you in any way, please let us know. I wish you all the best in making the changes and implementing those in your organization. And thank you so much for being with us today. Have a great day.
Thank you.